Welcome to the Nostalgia Podcast. My name's Matt Fulton, I'm your host, and also other bits and pieces in between. Anything to do with a website, I look after. Now, you've obviously downloaded this show because there's some bit of interest that you have with this particular episode. If not, you just like the site. Uh, let me tell you a bit about my background. I work in the Australian radio industry, um, always been a passionate part of my life, as well as a bit of media... TV, movies, everything else, uh, I'm always into the whole pop culture of Australian history and I can never find a direct source of you know, where we can contain it into the one area. So this is why I created Nostalgia. This is the first episode that I created, uh, which was done in late 2015. Um, I had just finished up or wrapped up where I had been working um, to take a, you know, I guess a three-month break, a, my own long service leave from the industry, and or oh, I'm back into it again now. Jamie Dunn, um, you may know him as Agro, uh, which is the talking bath mat carpet thing which he made something like that. Uh, I don't want to reveal too much because he explains it later on in the podcast. Uh, I had worked with Jamie uh, briefly for a few months um, before I made this podcast and he is such a lovely guy. At first I was embarrassed to ask him to be part of the podcast but he goes, yeah Matt, get in, you know, by all means let's sit down have a chat, have something, have a coffee, I'll come over to your house if you want and have, have a talk and so uh, apologies for all the ambience behind where, where we were sitting, um, next door there was another restaurant that was being built so that's why you hear all the hammers and Jamie uh, it was very helpful so um, enjoy this chat and, um, and if you do bump into him ask him to bring out the agro puppet because he does enjoy talking about agro. Here's the first episode of Nostalgia. Don't you think it's quite apt that we're sitting here and there's a garbage truck to our left? <laughs> I think my career might be in that. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, I just saw the 1980s go like that. So how was your morning this morning? Yeah, it went pretty well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, uh, strangely enough, I, I had a good show, yeah. I care about the show, but I'm very, very relaxed with it, you know. Yeah, well, is it different to how you, when you were doing B105 Breakfast yeah. uh, back in the day? You mean the great years? Yeah, the great years. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was the same. It was the same because I, the secret to it is not to really care, not to get, you know, not to over plan, just let the show, you know create itself kind of okay so there's a skeleton sort of where you're headed but um i'm lucky because the guy behind the panel is um very good ben yep and dobbo's really um you know he's like <laughs> you know <laughs> how far do you go back with radio when, when was the earliest time that you can remember that oh you started? um my earliest time was uh i remember uh 4bc with robbo in the afternoons um, I just went in, I was a songwriter and I went in there and he had an idea to do some suburb songs. So um, uh, we would do, I, I don't know, one a week or something. He'd get me in there and it'd be something like Sunny Bank, Sunny Bank, Sun, Sun, Sunny Bank, Sunny Bank, Sunny Bank. Yeah. <laughs> something, or, something original like that. Yeah. Um, oh, you know, and uh, I kind of I remember because I was a singer songwriter, I do remember being on air at 4BC as a guest talking about something and I remember losing my concentration. I don't know why. I, I, he was asking me questions. I think it was Robbo. And my mind wandered and he kind of went like this. So, Jamie, like, um, as far as singer-songwriting goes, my mind went off. I was thinking, oh, God, I've got to do that this afternoon and that tomorrow. And then it came back. So what do you think, Jamie? And I kind of went, could you repeat the question? I, I, <laughs> I kind of, you know, I guess I learned a lesson that day. Uh, you know, I do still lose concentration. I called Dobbo Marto this morning oh. and I said the phone number was 13353 and it's 13353. So <laughs> I don't know. Um, as far as going back, I kind of eased into radio and they only got me because I was the guy that did aggro. You know, um, B105 when 4BK in the day rang. They okay. rang Channel 7 and asked if they could speak to the guy that does agro. They didn't even know my name. So, oh. And 
luckily, I think that was on the cusp of radio, being radio, well, it's probably on another cusp now. You know, when <clears throat> in the old days you used to smile when you talked when you did radio like that, you know. It's 30, de- and you used to tie it into the songs too, so they go, it's 30 degrees and chance of a late storm. Speaking of storm, here's Rain by Dragon. And you kind of go, oh, my God. So when I came into it, I was just a bloke. And I didn't try and be a bloke. I was, just, And I've got the same voice now as when I was on B105. I've never forced the voice or tried to learn the skills of time calls or anything, you know. <laughs> so I think it became acceptable just to be a regular radio show and that that kind of was the success that the success ran for 16 years then i had a year of just hobbling along and then they got me <laughs> <laughs> with uh, your tv work you mentioned uh, well i did agro, agro with yeah. tv yeah and i used to produce music shows for channel seven. Oh, there's the grinder there's the grinder That's tough it. at the top yeah. It's tough at the top. Yeah. Well, no, I just... Agro was the same thing. I'd written a song. I never did the first Agro. I'd written a song... Because who do you sell songs to in Australia? John Farnham or John Farnham? You know, even now, it's just John Farnham. Oh, roughly what era was this? Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be 19... <laughs> it'll be 19... Late 1981, probably. Okay. Yeah, when I started Agro. And I had done a demo for the um, original Agro and put a monologue in the middle. And I'd written a song and sent it up to Channel 7. Um, yeah, and so I'd written this uh, song and I'd done the monologue in the middle. Ah, oh, Fiona, little furry guys like me. And I copied that guy's voice. And he had a legal problem with him. He, he, he had a problem with Channel 7 and, you know, sent them a letter going, um, I claim rights to this character. And Channel 7 went, all oh, right, no, you don't. And they, you know, they won in court and that was it. And, but they rang me on the Friday and said, can you do Agro live on the Saturday? And I said, because they'd heard my voice on the demo. I said, sure can, because in my business you say yes to everything yep. and then work out how to do it afterwards. So I turned, I practised all Friday night and I turned up Saturday morning because I think it was a 6 o'clock start. I, I could be wrong. Maybe it was 9 till 12. I can't remember when Super Saturday show was. <laughs> That's sad, eh? That's Saturday. And, <laughs> and I, I was kind of lying there. And I put uh, my arm up the puppet and um, I got the voice perfectly. I was going, we're giving away a trampoline today and we got the Snorks and the Smurfs and, oh, Fiona. And anyway, this guy crawls, his name was Ian Duncan, he crawls across the floor and holds up a sign. Can you please make the puppet's mouth move when he speaks? (laughs) (laughs) So I wouldn't say it was a professional start. That's Fiona McDonald, by the way. Can you explain that? Can you say that properly? Yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was um, that's the original Agro there. Oh, that was just me. I remember that shot. Well, yeah, it's a picture album of Fiona McDonald. Yeah, that's Jackie the CD. McDonald. That's that was the CD. A CD. Um, oh, sorry, uh, a seven-inch single of um, the song I was just talking about. Hmm. That's on RCA Victor, and um, it came out, you know. And there's the seven logo. Yep. And um, it was a single with Fiona and Agro. Okay, I'm about to play this to you. Yes. All right, and you're looking at a screen saying Behind the Blues. Hi, and welcome to Behind the Blues. In the next half hour, we're going to be doing that, taking you behind the cameras in the making of the Blues Brothers, as well as highlighting a couple of numbers from the Blues Brothers. Until then, sit back, relax, and enjoy with me the making of the Blues Brothers. Great stuff. Great stuff. Uh, A point of trivia. Okay, did you notice that in the movie that Elwood didn't do any of the driving? Well, the reason for that is that in real life, Belushi, behind the wheel, is a total maniac and Aykroyd totally refused to have him drive anywhere. We'll be back with more of Behind the Blues after this break. I think I made a mistake there in that one. How did that come across? Did they just, um, the Channel 7 executives just go, we need um, one of our talents? It was to... like almost midnight to dawn time slot. Yep. And uh, because it was a, they already had a Blues Brothers special, and I was pro- uh, producing a show up there called Seven Rock, uh, where I used Bill Reiner uh, to host it, who was just sensational. He really knows his music, that guy. And um, uh, I was also doing Saturday Jukebox, which was, uh, uh, you know, a teen sort of show on a Saturday morning yep. after after the agro show. <clears throat> so they just asked me what I hosted, and I did. 
didn't get any money for it. It was a, it was about I think it was eleven o'clock at night. It went to air, so it didn't matter how bad I was. It was just a filler, yeah. but it was one of those ones that you take to. Oh, I don't know. If someone says to you, "Oh, will you do this?" I always say yes. Yeah. And so I did it, and I'm amazed how good I was because that was pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did bring up a point about uh, an error with that, and because I'm a Blues Brothers nut, you meant to say yes, Jake, instead of yeah. that word about Jake. Yeah. <laughs> but was, you, there's that a certain driving. <laughs> yeah, but there's there's certain nervousness when you're doing it without an auto cue. You know what I mean? Well, I was going to say, did you improv that? Or yeah, yeah. So that you know what you're going to say, but then when you say it and. And because it was so cheap, I was kind of the producer as well as the presenter. And so I thought, I finished that. Oh, thank God I'm finished. I'm not doing that one again. <laughs> but having seen that, it's completely wrong. Ah, oh, okay. Now I'm going to show you this clip here. Love the song. Huey. The hairstyles, eh? Oh, Brian Bury, Don Lane, whatever his name is, <laughs> Kerry Ann Kennelly, George Negus. Johnny Young, Alf. That was. Is that a Logies thing? Yep. It is a Logies thing. Yeah. This ah. is the 30th annual TV Week Logie Awards with Daryl Summers, live from the Hyatt on Collins in Melbourne. So that was the 1988 Logie Awards. Oh, was it? The oh my God. Now, can you remember? Like, and Agro was featured in there a couple of times. Yeah. What was your work like? Back then, so oh, my like my then? work uh, was. But what were you doing with Agro back then? Uh, it was relentless, absolutely relentless, um, because having been in bands, um, I think I had a unique um, skill. Uh, like I was a drummer in bands, and um, you try and you try and you try, and then you get success with a puppet. <laughs> Isn't that strange? And then. Of course, that um, in bands you're ringing everyone looking for work. When you're on television and uh, the puppet is, uh, you know, um, gets some traction, the phone rings all the time. Will you do this? Will you do this? Will you, can you come down and do the logies? Can you, can you shoot something for the logies? And, and the phone just rang. I didn't have to ring anyone for work, and I I knew that I had something, and I had the skills to like from the band days of trying to get money from people who didn't want to pay you trying to get, uh, you know, a job from someone who didn't want to employ you, uh, to having something that really worked. And it was a breeze, and I was ready for it. And I said yes to absolutely everything, everything. So my weekends would be maybe three fates on a Saturday, three fates with Jill Ray, uh, maybe two on the Sunday, um, you know, and that was all extra money. And in those days, we used to go out for $250 or something, I'd give Jill 125, and I'd take 125, and oh, you're quite generous. Well, well, in the end, I didn't. <laughs> I had a big fight with Jill one time, and I said to her, I pointed to the uh, board. I always used to have an idiot sheet up in my office with all the jobs on it. I didn't hide it from anyone. Hmm. And uh, she came in, and uh, she'd going out with this guy, and he he must have said, "Are you sure you get the right money or something?" Uh. And I was giving her half the money anyway. Yep. And the book was always on the table. And I remember I made her cry. I didn't mean to. Oh, well, I did mean to, I guess. Um, she came in, sat down, and she said, oh, I want to know, you know, I want to have a look at the books to see where my money's going. And I said, well, they're, they're right in front of you there and it's up on the board. And by, while we're looking at that board behind me, you see all that work there? I can do that with a trained chimp. <laughs> I got real bad. She, she teared up a little bit. I kept going, but she wouldn't cry. She just wouldn't cry. I kept at her. But anyway, it's all good. I still work with her now, so she's forgiven me. <laughs> this, yeah, because you recently did the Agro Up Late. Yeah, which was fantastic. Yeah. Isn't um, that strange? A couple of um, drag friends uh, that I go and see at the North Hipswich Bowls Club had written their own little show, and they're having it at this 50-seat uh, theatre over at Morningside. 
And I went to see them, and uh, they only did two nights there, and, and, and but they were good, and it was it was really intimate and really good. I came away from there, and because I'm now almost broke and struggling for money, I was trying to figure out how to, you know, create some work. And so I saw the theatre manager, Damien Lee, and I said, why don't we do some aggro shows? Some I'll do a half hour of stand up, and then we do an aggro show. And he called it aggro up late. And bugger me if it wasn't sold out in a matter of hours. Hours. But it, mind you, it's a 50 seat theatre, so we did four shows straight away, sold. And then I did another two when I got, I was supposed to do the, Bo, the Bowie Muster, host that. I had that in my book, and I rang them, and they went, oh, this was, a, you know, the revenge of a radio station. I think uh, one of the country music stations I worked at must have said to them, I'm only surmising, you know, we won't work with Jamie Dunn's out there. Yeah. So um, all of a sudden I got dumped from that, and uh, I was okay with that. I didn't mind it. That's the business kind of. And, um, and so I rang him back. I said, I've got two more free dates. And uh, he put them up, and we sold those out. So I did six shows... And they got better and better. They really did. Like, Jill Ray is like opening an old bottle of wine. You know, <laughs> the first taste a little bit sour, but the end of, at the end of it, oh, man, she was just fantastic. And the audiences were just were just great. Were the demographics for the audience... Eight to 80, happen? blind, crippled or crazy. They were just wonderful. You know, they were laughing. Uh, you know, um, the first night was a little bit clunky, I thought, but afterwards people were saying, you know... Loved it, loved it. Second night was great. Third night it was fantastic. Fourth night it was phenomenal. Fifth night it was unbelievable. The sixth night I was so out of control with the puppet and what I was doing. It was. <laughs> it was really. I really liked doing it. And I'd say to Jill, I think we're taking it. We're taking it to the top. We're going to Harvey Bay with that show next. At this level, you know, and I don't mean a very high level. I mean, you know, not has been level, but bordering. And uh, and uh, at that level, when you know, you're nervous that you're not going to sell 50 seats. And I was so surprised that we sold 50 seats a night for six nights, sold out. And there are people like you going, oh, I wish I'd have been there. Hmm. And um, I, I was oh, enthused by it, reinvigorated by it. Um, uh, there was a lot of pressure leading up to it, thinking it wasn't going to do it. But, uh, you know, when the guy rings you uh, eight hours afterwards and says, it's OK, they're sold out. You go, oh, wow. So there's still a market for it. Yeah. Because a generation grew up with agro, you know, and they know, and with those those bloopers, oh, my God, have you seen them? Yeah. Well, yeah, here well, it goes. I have something <laughs> up. That was the next question. <laughs> now, this is uh, the agro bloopers that are infamously known on YouTube. Yeah, I know. Okay. So this, is this, you've seen them, haven't you, or since? Well, I'll give you an idea. I was walking through my house when I was married, uh, and my kids were gathered around the computer, and they went, "Hey, Dad!" And it was a big, very big house, so it went, "Hey, Dad! Hey, Dad! Hey, Dad! Hey, Dad!" I had a mansion on the beach. I don't have it anymore. And I said, "Yeah, what? Yeah, what? Yeah, what? Yeah, what?" And then I uh, walked up the stairs, and uh, I said, "You're on YouTube." And back in those days, I went, "I'm on what?" And they said, "YouTube. You're on YouTube." And I had a look at it, and I thought, "Oh my God!" And these days, when when I when I saw it with my kids. I thought, oh, my God, I'm either going to be in prison or I'm going to be waking up next to Rolf Harris. (laughs) (laughs) Give me your karate. (laughs) It's aggro doing it. I love it. I wouldn't push it with me, aggro. And how good was Anne-Marie? Look at how she's reacting to that. Do I get an apology? I'm sorry, Anne-Marie. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Can you just hang on to that? Are you ready for your internal? Oh, of course. What do you think this is? You are so bad. You really are. You are unbelievable. Where do you get off all this stuff? Get out of here, you dirty thing. Oh, yeah, let's just catch you. Let's just see what you do. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's, it's fun. I've seen it, I don't know, and it's funny, like, it's funny even now, hey, I'm laughing at it again. Because, like myself, grew up watching Agro and 
all the other shows that you've done. Yeah. And seeing stuff like that, you would never really see that at all. Um, oh, I mate, my favourite my yeah. favorite one on that is where um, she says it's a good luck troll and um, Agro goes... I reckon my hair would go like that too if I had a pencil up my ass. <laughs> <laughs> I was so relaxed at work, and I took that to radio, you know. That's where how I was at radio. Not that disgusting, but uh, off air I was pretty disgusting. Yep. Yeah. You know. Uh, um, no, not, I've, not, I've heard some <laughs> stories. Not, not full stories, but no, I just heard the no, other yeah, there's, and there's some is urban myth. Yeah. And... Uh, I wasn't sure if I should bring this up or not. You can, you can. I, I, I'm totally aware of it. Yeah. But it's just the other, everyone else out there. Yeah. Because it's radio folklore about the the infamous wheat bix story. The wheat bix. Yeah. Okay. Okay. In- so well, we might as well just lay it out clean. No problem. We'll get it out there and uh, yeah, we'll see where it goes. Okay. Well, <laughs> I got to work and, and when when in radio, you know, you don't have time to go out for your breakfast. You can't, well, once the show starts and all of the preparation, you got to stay in the studio. There's no, like, there's no getting any more breakfast. If you miss your breakfast, you're buggered. So I turned up on the Monday, and I knew I'd left four wheat in um, in the, the box. And I used to put them in... There used to be a concertina file, a big library of um, records uh, at B105 from the 4BK days. And I put my wheat under W which I thought was pretty clever. I go to my box of wheat bix and someone's flogged my four wheat bix. I was pissed off. I was cheesed. I waited a week, and on the Friday, I specifically left four wheat bix. But before I put them in the box, I went into the loo, and I baked each one of them between the cheeks of my ass. Baked them. I left them there for, I don't know, 30 seconds... Or so, but it was a real bake for each one of them. Enough, I, enough for it to be uh, sponge worthy. Uh, no, 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 it's still crispy. I had to really do some cleaning work after that. But um, uh, yeah, so I put them back in the box and I put them under W and I closed the thing. I turned up on the Friday and I opened it up again. I went there and they were gone. And then I told the story on the radio. I said, This is what I did. The phone rings almost immediately. There was a guy called Jamie said, it wasn't me. <laughs> and you know at state school, when someone farted, they go, first, first smell, first stink. Yep. I always have my suspicions about Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not so sure which year this is from, but... Oh, I know this one. And the uh, winner is Humphrey, please. Come on, Humphrey. 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 Get a look at the winner, Humphrey. Come on, you two. Shock the management. Speak. You can do it. Speak! Speak! You can do it! You are not an animal! <laughs> I'm funny. How fun was that to be up on stage with... Uh, Is that Dickie Dick, Neem? Dickie Neem. Yeah, yeah. Bad Cat and Humphrey B. Bear. See the size of the box? There's the two of us in there. I'm on, well, as we look at it, stage left. And I think it was a guy called Mark. And he was the floor manager from Channel 9 that used to do Dickie Neem. And... Over the years, I developed a um, like a little talkback thing on the belt, uh, communications belt, where I could push a button, speak to the director, and say um, I'm about to push his face in some uh, custard uh, on camera three. Don't miss it. Um, but that could go to the director, but not to air. So this was live, was live on television. And when we were sitting in there doing the rehearsal, I said to Mark because I've always liked Dickie now. I love that whole concept. And I said to him, so, and I'm wearing this belt with all the buttons and the whiz-bangs and stuff, so I talk to directors and so forth. I said to him, so, how how do you do this? Do you do the same as me with, like, a director talk back sort of on your belt and stuff? And this guy says to me, no, whenever John Blackman speaks, I shake the stick. (laughs) That was how he did Dickie (laughs) Knee. Oh, God, I laughed. But I love that about Australian television, don't you? It doesn't mean anything. It's so simple. Yeah. And, and, you know, to, to start abusing, like Agro was abusing uh, Humphrey Bear going, speak, speak, because they had the idea, and that was ad lib. Hmm. Um, it was the poor bugger in the suit was turning it around, turning it around, trying to 
get the right thing so he could see through the gauze. <laughs> <laughs> and to fill that space, I'm going, speak, speak. And then I'm thinking, you are not an animal. <laughs> That's funny as. The next one, this one here. Can you explain Jamie Come Home? Yes, I wrote a song about someone I loved. Me. Yeah. <laughs> I've played them all, I've played them all. Every school social out and every little church. Okay, so I had a cold when I recorded that and it made me sound sexy. I'm definitely not a sexy man. With Gary McDonald. Yeah. Uh, Norman Gunston. No, no, not Norman Gunston. He was a. Um, Gary McDonald is a, uh, a great Brisbane guitarist and a great musician and a friend of mine. And, um, he arranged that song. And that song I wrote in those days when it was a single, like that seven inch single, you wrote the flip side because you get the same publishing from the flip side as you do for the A side. So if the A side is like you'll find in those old records of Sadie the Cleaning Lady, John Farnham would have written the B side because you get paid the same amount for the A side as the B side. So well that might be the other way around. See I made another mistake just like the Blues Brothers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't changed. I'm still consistent. Um, and so what happened with that was when it went to radio they didn't like the A side, they turned it over and played the B side and then Jamie Come Home, the song I wrote, um, uh, out of honesty I'd say, I'm not much of a singer, but I had a cold when I recorded it so it sounded a lot better than it should have and uh, we recorded it in Brisbane uh, and oh, it was number one on the 4BK request chart, that's because most of my family rang up and requested it and um, you know, it went quite well right Oh, I guess the, the the three states. It was it was in the top twenty, I guess, in uh, Sydney and in Melbourne. And so I was doing a lot of uh, promotional work. And I remember it was mixed in Melbourne. And the guy who, because it was from Brisbane, he said, "Oh, we'll have to remix it virtually without listening to it." So he he put in a remix. And then he played it back to me, and it was the same mix that we sent down, and I didn't have the heart to say to him, I said to him, oh, that's much better. But it was the same mix. Yeah. Corkhead. That's... <laughs> Speaking of the music part. We get up every morning, just as a starting story. I wrote that too. Cartoon Connection. The Cartoon Connection. We'll make you laugh and help you get through. Okay, so we've got the opening titles from 1995. Yeah. Okay, if you can see that properly, you've got Teresa Livingston. Yeah, lovely, wonderful. And you have Crikey the Clown, the other Ian way around. Ian Calder, very, 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 very talented man who will tell you until the cows come home, he has no talent at all. If I stalled in a sentence, he would finish it. Yeah. And if he left a gap, I would fill it. It would, you know, we were... We were real tight as far as friends and uh, the ability to speak on air, yeah, so it was good. I have admired Ian right from the day I met him. And uh, the day I met him, he was a French artist on Wombat and he came and he was a quiet, introverted, timid man up in um, traffic in Channel 7 and he did some acting. And so they got him down on the set to do the French artist. And this timid man came leaping out from behind the flat, going, oh, 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 hello, hello, hello. And I thought, wow, look at the talent. And he writes and voices. He's just brilliant. He's brilliant. He should be, you know, he should be somewhere. Does he underestimate himself? Yes, yeah. yeah. I remember being at B105 in a room with him, and uh, the guy from B105 was saying, we're going to pay you $350 a week to do voices. Ian said, oh, I'm not worth that. Oh, and you look at me, I'm looking at you now going, yeah. I, I did the double take. <laughs> oh, my God. 
And then I said, well, if you're not going to pay him that money, give it to me. But no, I didn't. And Ranger <laughs> Stacey, how beautiful is Ranger Stacey? See, the, look at that team. How can I not? There's Agro in the middle. I've got Ranger Stacey, who is just, to this day, absolutely brilliantly wonderful for being normal. And you just, you just warm to it. Brilliant, crikey the clown. Teresa Livingston was just wonderful. And the best of all, Gibbo. Gibbo, big Gibbo in those... He, another, and he's a close personal friend of Ian for years and years and years, and of mine now. And once again, if you dropped the ball, he'd catch it. If he dropped the ball, Ian would catch it. If Ian dropped the ball, I'd catch it. If I dropped the ball, Teresa would pick it up. If Teresa dropped the ball, Ranger State, and it just, we couldn't fail, you know. I just surrounded myself with really good people, yeah. which is the key to, to, you know, how I've been successful. Uh, I just had good people around me. Some of them I didn't even like. <laughs> but let's not bring Ian Skippin into this. Let's, <laughs> let's just move on. Uh, I started with Fiona. And Fiona had had a. But enough. that's going back to Wombat or. Is yeah, that that's at Wombat and uh, um, uh, the Super Saturday show. Fiona yeah. hosted oh, yeah. that. Super and then I hosted with Jill Ray, who um, they, they did auditions when I didn't have control. And on those auditions was Tiffany Lamb and people like that. But uh, I purposely didn't work very well with any of them, uh, I only worked well with Jill in the auditions to make sure Jill got the job because that's who I wanted to have the job. Oh. So I was just terrible, but I got my own way. <laughs> yeah, so, and then uh, after Jill, there was Anne-Marie. Jill wanted to have kids, and uh, I did say to her, you know, um, we need timing here, and I think she said something like, what, I've got to ask you when I can have a baby? And um, I said, no, but when was the last time you saw a pregnant woman on a children's television show? But these days, of course, that's... They celebrate it, but back in those days, it was you know, okay, she's pregnant, she's finished. Yeah. So there's nothing more beautiful than a pregnant woman. Yeah, nowadays. I mean, I looked like one for many years. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well played, nice. But uh, yeah, now it's uh, we fully encourage it. So yeah, well, I see now. I see. Um, some replays up on YouTube of uh, Cartoon Connection. So did you hear that? Jamie looks at the... YouTube. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, you know, you and, and claim... Oh, do you actually own the rights to that? Or? No, 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 no. Channel 7 have always owned the rights to Agro and everything, yeah. There you go. So he won't flag it as inappropriate or copyright. There you are. No, no, yeah. it's all good. <laughs> but I see that on YouTube now, some bits of it, and it still... It had it lives because it's live television. Yeah. Well, it was uh, yeah, it was pre-recorded. What I'm saying it was pre-recorded live, so it's um, live to tape yep. and no stopping. We had an audience um, and we just ran, no repairing, no whatever. You know, all stammers kept in. Good, except for the adult bloopers, obviously. Oh, <laughs> except for those, yes. Yeah, I also no. did. The oh, Super the- Saturday Show. The Super Saturday Show. The Super Saturday Show. The Super. Now, who can write things like that? <laughs> the only guy that's not on a Sunday. There's a few. Uh, it was, and I did. I changed it to the Super Sunday, and give I guess the Super Sunday show, the Super Sunday show. <laughs> <laughs> but I did that. Yeah, how bad's that? What was it like to film in front of kids? For goodness sake! Oh, it was great. Yeah, it was great because you like. It's no different to those live shows I did at Morningside, mm. to the um, Studio Theatre Cafe. Um, it's live, and so. You can't stop. You know, when the, when you've lost the room, you've lost the room. Hmm. And we took great care of our audience. You know, we really, really... Uh, actually, Holly Brisley was one of the ones... Uh, was the last one that was to host, but then the show was canned before she really got to host. Is that because of uh, Cheese TV? Or... No, 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 not at all. It was because um, uh, uh, Saturday Disney... We, we were so successful that it attracted the attention of the Disney empire because if they were looking to break into Australian television they simply bought the biggest rating time slot which we had built up and that was the, the cruelty of television it had nothing oh, to do with cheese TV yeah. yeah because yeah, it you know. suddenly disappeared and went oh okay. well you know it happens it, that, you know if you can't accept no mm. well you know you're in the wrong business you have to just move on eh? yeah one more this is now you <laughs> you, 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 you many of your agro Merchandise, yeah. albums, singles. Yeah. Joe, Dolce. Joe Dolce. That's it. Yeah.
it's a not so bad. It's a not so close. Shut up your face. Okay. Big time hits. <laughs> 28, it, it is J&B Records. Hey there, little red riding hood. 28 of the funniest songs of all time. That's what it was, J&B. And the, I met the guy from J&B and he said, why, why won't you do a, why don't you come and do an album? And of course I went, yes, can do. And I recorded 28, 28 songs. <laughs> Uh, itsy Bitsy te- Teeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini Monster Mash All those quirky songs uh, With a mate of mine Peter Blyton Out of Sydney And um, I was just You know They paid a licensing fee To have Agro sing those songs And yeah I don't know how many we sold now, When you recorded that mm. Did you use Agro? Yes or, oh, oh, oh no no you like a method No I didn't <laughs> No no I didn't have him on my hand No no I just I just recorded his voice Yeah you Channeled him yeah, but because I was in bands and stuff, you know, recording albums was pretty straightforward for me, and even better with Agro because, you know, you can lean into it a bit, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it was good. I've got one more here, which wouldn't say. Can you explain these images? I'm showing here. He got Agro's Mega Munch. Agro's cream. Mega Munch was the um, uh, idea of uh, Paul's over at uh, West End at the time. And they were going to... It was an idea of, um, of theirs, which was a bubblegum nose. Let's not mention Bubble Bill here, eh? Who? Bubble Bill, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and they were looking for a sell-in, uh, something... So if you ordered the latest thing, then you generally order some back catalogue, and that could be ice creams or music or books or anything. So that was that. And they were very professional, and I loved it. They look, look at the ice cream. It's fantastic. I mean, look how detailed it is. It's yeah. basically an exploding star, sun-type yeah, shape. With, yeah, yeah. I'm guessing... Oh, yeah, there we go. Caramel, chocolate, and vanilla. Yeah, with, with a, a choc- with a real bubblegum nose. Oh. Now, this one here, how much influence did you have with the... Agro Game Boy game. Well, the good thing about Agro was that anyone that developed a um, uh, now Nintendo uh, did the uh, Game Boy game, um, and the good thing about being an Agro is they had the attitude, his attitude before, you know, they came to me. So with that Agro Mega Munch, you know, and like with this Agro Saw, and I was just talking to a guy the other day because the uh, Nintendos are coming back in. Oh, yeah they're, yeah, they're always trendy. And, yeah, uh, yeah, and so, retro. you know, if you find an aggro saw game, it's quite a good game. He's on a skateboard, and he has to jump over ravines and, you know, boulders and stuff. So that's what that is, yeah. And that would be the... There's, a, there's 28 described. of the funniest uh, songs ever recorded in a two-CD pack on J&B Records. The other one which I don't have a photo of uh, is your arcade game. Oh, that was a cracker. Yeah, there's one uh, located, well, when I checked a while ago, um, in Myers Centre. The... There was one in the Myers Centre. There was one in Ipswich. And there's a lovely man called John. I'm thinking Paige. Um, but anyway, uh, this guy called John uh, rang the Morningside Theatre and said, how would you like an aggro game uh, in the foyer as the people come in? And he delivered it. He had bought it and done it up, and that game uh, where you had to hit the cockroaches as they run across the screen, Agro would slap them down, and uh, it would go into what they call a tracked mode, and a tracked mode was Agro going, hey, psst, kids, you want to play a game? <laughs> but it was lots of fun, but uh, you know, probably uh, insensitive to you know <laughs> attracting children to play a game, but anyway... <laughs> Tickets, tickets, you win heaps of tickets. Yeah, they were great. We sold, um, uh, that was obviously through my, um, uh, the company that I was with, uh, which was Agro Enterprises with my friend Ron. And uh, I think we sold about 15 of those. I might have that wrong, maybe even, uh, because I remember I got, my share was $1,500 every time they sold one of those games. It wasn't like a royalty, it was more a fee as they sold. And they sold a couple in Indonesia and a couple in Japan. Wow. Well, Japan just pick up basically anything. I know. I watched a thing last night which was um, oh, something like, will you be my girlfriend or something in oh, Japanese. Uh, if you are the one. If you are the one, that's the one. <laughs> yeah. And all these cracking hot, um, you know, lovely ladies are there. 
and this guy comes out um, and tries to get them interested in him. Yeah, and I think there was one the other day where yeah. some chick was after a guy, like no matter who it is, he can be fat or ugly, he could be this, that, as long as he likes horror movies. Well, I thought before, I, before I hit the bedroom, you've got to tell a lot of jokes, mate, <laughs> a lot of jokes. Is that to take the focus off something? <laughs> uh, possibly, possibly. <laughs> And um, if you want a scoop, yes, I have taken aggro to bed. Uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you describe aggro simply as a, floor, a bathroom mat. Oh, a bath mat. No, but, uh, yeah, that was a bit of it. Like, when I get him out and, uh, and when he's on my arm, like, I, I was at Morayfield Shopping Centre the other day and there's some kids uh, lined up in front of aggro and they don't even know who he is, right? He's been off television forever. Um, oh, that, I might rep- reprise that and say, well, they know him from YouTube, I guess, mm. some of them. But anyway, this kid comes up to Agro, and I'm standing there right beside him. I've got him on my arm, and this kid goes to Agro, you're a puppet. And Agro goes, no, I'm not. And the kid goes, yes, you are. And then Agro goes, no, I'm not. And th- there it is, he's connected, and he's arguing with the puppet. You know, and then Agro goes, it's the guy beside me that's the dummy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> But um, do you like, do you see Agro? Well, he technically hasn't really left. He's just stepped away from. I don't know. Because... You know, like who knows? I have tried a couple of times to. You're talking about? Uh, do I see him coming back on TV? Yeah, or any type of. Well, In America, you... if it was America, I would be back on TV. But because it's Australia, and I, I understand that, like it, it's a tough market out here, because. It's, it's not an industry, it's almost like a hobby. You know what I mean? If you've got a great idea. Mm. Like, you would never, ever get Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles up as a show in Australia. Yeah. As I understand it, they sketched them out on a, uh, on a napkin at a restaurant and had the idea. You would never get Seinfeld. If I walked in to a television executive and said, I've got a show about nothing, it's just me talking to my mates... Well, I would be thrown out, you know. As would Paul McCartney, if he wasn't Paul McCartney and he walked into a music, you know, uh, executive and said, it's going to be the biggest selling single of all time. It goes, my love can tire, oh, Mr. Rowling. And he'd be like, no, 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 oh, don't be pleasing. <laughs> they would have tossed him out. Would you do anything, say, uh, if you had the time, the budget? Or... Now you can make it... it show so cheaply and just throw it up on YouTube now and get a boy. I would do anything. Yeah, anything. Like, you know, the theme of what I've been saying is, you know, say yes first and work out how to do it later. I would, if you uh, called me and said, hi, my name's Irving Schmidlap and I have much money and I want to do a 30-second ad to promote, oh, I don't know, uh, dog feces in a park, I would say, yep, I can do that. <laughs> Even if money's not right. If someone said... Like, I have pulled into a service station and uh, up the coast, the guy said, we're shooting a short uh, for the course, the film and television course at the uni. Um, Would you mind... It would be a nice little cameo appearance. Um, Would you do it? And I, not by agra, by me. I said, sure will. And uh, all I had to do was walk out and uh, fill their petrol up and say that'll be 15 bucks, mate. I get it. You're basically up for hire for pretty much... I think everyone yeah, is, Anything within reason. Yeah, in, in, in our business, yeah. in Australia, be it television, radio, whatever it is, you have to do everything to get something. It's, it's amazing, you know. It, it, you have to... It's a business. Like, I've got, like, next week, I've got bills to pay. Mm. So, you know, I've, I've got to find some work. So you're highly approachable and... Yeah, you just ask and, um, yeah, depending on... Yeah, I don't even care if there's no budget, I do it. I, yeah. Seriously, you know, because you never know what comes from it. All right, well, I'll wrap up with... Um, looks like I can't think of anything else you've covered. Well, <laughs> look, why don't, why don't we do next time, let's do who sacked you and how. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, mate. Captain Connection. Yeah!
Thanks very much for listening to the Ostalgia podcast. Uh, that wraps up the first episode uh, with Jamie Dunn. He was fantastic, as I said, and he is more than happy to chat to anyone. that you, If you bump into him in the street, in, bump into him in the shopping centre, have a chat to him, and he'll just crank out the puppet and, you know, you play along with it and <laughs> it'll be all good. But he is a Australian TV legend. I can't praise him enough. So, um, yeah, thanks uh, very much. And the next uh, episode, well, hopefully there'll be more. Um, but either way, uh, make sure you visit nostalgia.com. Uh, thanks for listening, downloading, and spread the word. Like us on Facebook um, at Nostalgia and on Twitter as well at Nostalgia. But also, if you've got any feedback, feel free to email me, nostalgia at gmail.com. All right, I'm Matt Fulton, and I'm out of here, and I'm yet to think of a witty catchphrase to sign off with. Cheers.